our 13th year of reading together. Before I introduce Jerry Dennis, I'd like to first acknowledge our many partners and call your attention to some of the Great Lakes inspired programs that we have coming up in the next few weeks. As many of you know, the purpose of reading together is to build a stronger community with deeper connections through the common experience of reading and discussing the same book. Whether you've attended this author program every year, that is 12 years already, or if this is your first time, you should certainly know that we also plan together. Thanks to the assistance of an extremely dedicated steering committee representing other area libraries, educational institutions, and organizations whose mission tie in with this year's Great Lakes theme, reading together is truly a community effort. It begins with the brainstorming and planning stages that began several months ago to the actual presentation phase that we kick off tonight. Hopefully, you've seen the list of community partners on the library's website, in our Reading Together brochure, or on the slides here this evening. I want to thank each and every community member, presenter, and participant in this year's lineup of events. And I especially want to thank Karen Trout, our Reading Together coordinator. chairs the selection and the steering committees. She coordinates all of these events and she leads many of the book discussion groups. Thank you, Karen. And I especially want to acknowledge the generous contribution that made it possible for us to meet Jerry tonight, namely our very, very good friends, the friends of the Kalamazoo Public Library. I'll say I'm betting you too could be a Friends member. I think they're set up out in the lobby. Yeah. <laughs> it is our hope that after reading The Living Great Lakes and hearing Jerry Dennis tonight, and perhaps tomorrow at Davenport University, you'll be inspired to attend some of the other programs that have been planned. Let me mention just a few. Join us at the library this Friday, March 6th, for Art Hop, where we'll feature Great Lakes-themed railing ceramics, as well as Traverse City artist Glenn Wolf, who has also illustrated many of Jerry Dennis's books. And of course, we'll have the music of Kalamazoo's own Great Lakes Grass Bluegrass Band. If environmental issues interest you, you will have several options from learning how Lake Michigan shapes the natural communities of Southwest Michigan to hearing about the history and current state of biological threats to the Great Lakes and exploring the health of our local watershed as undertaken by a group of citizen scientists. For many of us, the Great Lakes are at the heart of various recreational pursuits. We're pleased to offer programs highlighting just a few of those, namely hiking, fishing, and surfing, if you could believe it. And of course, what would a month of programming about the Great Lakes be without a historical exploration into some legendary Lake Michigan shipwrecks? We feel confident that having the opportunity to attend these programs and interact with your fellow readers will not only heighten the experience of reading this fascinating book, but also strengthen your own Great Lakes connections. As you leave tonight, you will be given a small card providing a URL and a QR code that will enable you to give us feedback online about reading together. We value your input and we welcome your suggestion for future titles in the years ahead. And just one more announcement. After tonight's presentation, Jerry Dennis will sign books in the lobby. Our good friend Dean from Michigan News Agency will be selling not only the Living Great Lakes, 
but also some brand new editions of Jerry's other books as well. And now on to the main event and the reason we're all here. Jerry Dennis grew up in rural northern Michigan and has earned his living since 1986 writing about places where nature and human culture meet. His essays and short fiction have appeared in more than 100 publications, including the New York Times, Smithsonian, Audubon, Oron, American Way, Gray's Sporting Journal, and Michigan Quarterly Review. His books, many of them illustrated by artist Glenn Wolf, are widely acclaimed, have won numerous awards, and have been translated into several languages. In 1999, the Michigan Library Association named Jerry the Michigan Author of the Year. And in 2003, the University of Louisville School of Arts and Sciences recognized his achievements in literature with its Outstanding Alum of the Year Award. He is a frequent guest speaker at universities and elsewhere, and he serves on the faculty of the University of Michigan's Bear River Writers Conference, where he teaches creative nonfiction. In 2014, Jerry teamed with the artist Glenn Wolf and creative director Gail Dennis to form Big Maple Press. They publish special editions of their books, making them available for sale only at independent bookstores. Please join me in welcoming to Kalamazoo, Jerry Dennis. selection process of, for this terrific honor. It's just almost makes a writer speechless to have this kind of an honor. To think of a whole community reading one's book is, is pretty heady stuff. <laughs> I would like to start with some prepared remarks. And then I'll follow it up with um, a short reading from, um, from either The Living Great Lakes or from another book that's also relevant. And then I'd like to open it up to a conversation with all of you. So I hope you'll think about some questions and comments you might have or some stories you want to tell, and we'll see what we can what we can do to, to bring the Great Lakes to life for all of us. For most of my life, I've been trying to find what, for lack of a better word, I'll call the soul of the Great Lakes. I don't use the term lightly. I wouldn't use it at all, except that it's the best word we have for what I'm talking about. We use it to mean the essence of a person, or a piece of music, or a place. It's heart, it's spirit, the best part of something, it's true meaning. I've been trying to find the soul of a lot of things in my life, but the Great Lakes are special. They're where I grew up, and where many of my ideas about the world were formed, and where, despite a restless nature, I choose to stay. My earliest memories of the lakes are still fresh after more than 50 years. They're vivid and they're flooded with contradictions. When I was five years old, we lived for a summer on the shore of Lake Michigan in Empire, within sight of Sleeping Bear Dunes. I remember the dunes as an immense yellow wave rising to meet the lake. I remember white caps shredded by the wind and furious breakers hurling themselves at shore. I remember being stunned the lake was so powerful and mysterious and en enormous that when I stood on the beach, I assumed I was looking at an ocean. But that same beach was fouled with alewives that had died by the millions and washed up into rotting heaps as high as my head. We had to wade through them to get to the water's edge. Their stench carried far inland. The house we rented had a telescope mounted on a pedestal before the picture window. At night, my father would aim it at freighters passing on the horizon, and as I stood on a chair and watched, he would tell me they were bound for New York, London, Tokyo. And he told me that these lakes that connected us to the world were sick to death with industrial and biological pollutants that he could never have imagined when he was a child. 
He told me about fishing for lake trout in the 1940s and 50s and how the fish rose from the cold depths and hit the lures fishermen trolled on wire lines and how there was always a chance of catching a monster of 30 or 40 pounds. And he said that now the lake trout were gone, decimated by an invasion of predatory lamprey that seemed like creatures from a horror film. In their place was this other invader, the alewife, which with few predator fish to check it, had filled the lakes until they accounted for 90% of the biomass of everything living there. He told stories about his father-in-law, my grandfather, who died a year before I was born, and who as a young man worked for the U.S. Life Saving Service on South Manitou Island, and had helped rescue crews of ships that foundered on the sandbars in the Manitou Passage. He talked about the storms that swept the lakes and made boating of every kind so hazardous that only a fool would venture out with checking the weather forecast and keeping an eye on the horizon. But few people went out in pleasure boats anymore in those days. There was no reason to. The water stank and the fish were gone. I was with my father when the first runs of coho salmon returned to Platte Bay in 1967 and revitalized the Great Lakes. We caught them until our arms ached and went home day after day drunk on this exotic bounty that was unlike anything we had ever experienced. And I was with him when a storm swept in from the west and sent that fleet of small boats racing in panic to shore. I was just a boy, but I joined my father and others on the beach as they tried to rescue anglers who had gone into the water. And though my father tried to stop me from seeing, I watched as some of, as some of those men died. I've spent much of my writing career, more than a quarter of a century now, trying to tell the story of this amazing, beautiful, and heartbreaking place. It's a big story, a complex story, and it's changing all the time. I've tried to tell it in essays, articles, stories, and poems, in a memoir, in a coffee table book, in television scripts and treatments. In The Living Great Lakes, I told the story from the deck of boats, sailing, motoring, and paddling through all five lakes and helping to deliver the schooner Malabar from Traverse City to Bar Harbor, Maine. In the Windward Shore, I told a more introspective story while living on the shores of Lakes Michigan and Superior and thinking about philosophical questions we face as human beings in the natural world. In the Bird and the Waterfall, I told the scientific story, placing the Great Lakes in global perspective while exploring the natural histories of oceans, rivers, and lakes. I'm in a dilemma familiar to everyone. The more we learn, the more there is to learn. The more we see, the more there is to see. The more we do, the more that remains to be done. Is the Great Lakes the story of enormous ice sheets plowing the earth, then melting to fill the basins they dug? Is it the story of the ancient people who migrated here as ice receded to hunt woolly mammoths and giant elk and form sophisticated societies that thrived for thousands of years? Is it the story of the Europeans that followed and the furs, forests, and minerals they harvested and the cities they built on the shores? Is it the story of Cleveland's Cuyahoga River catching fire in 1969 and igniting the conscience of the nation, the environmental conscience, conscience of the nation? Is it the story of the world's greatest freshwater fishery, its collapse and resurgence, and now perhaps its imminent collapse again? Is it the story of dead zones in the lakes and avian botulism? Is it the story of organisms that have inhabited the lakes since the Ice Age, like the amphipod Dipariah, which until a decade ago was found in concentrations of 10,000 per square meter of lake bottom, and now has disappeared almost entirely from Lakes Michigan and Huron? Is it the story of the water itself, which will become increasingly precious as, global, as the global water crises intensify? Is it the story of sailboat races and Voyager canoes, of sea kayaking and surfing, of Lake Michigan's Petoskey stones and Lake Superior's agates, of shipping and shipwrecks, of pristine beaches and spectacular rock formations, and a national park that was recently declared the most beautiful place in America? The answer, of course, is yes. It's all of those stories and countless others. They are messy stories filled with contradictions. They include the good and the bad, the hopeful and the discouraging, the entertaining and the distressing. Taken together, they are the story of one of the most amazing natural wonders on earth and one of the least appreciated. The Great Lakes are like five beautiful and charismatic sisters, willful, tempestuous, frequently charming, impossible to ignore. You can set out to know them, but it is not an easy task. Getting to know a small place is hard enough, 
You can spend a lifetime learning your own backyard, but the Great Lakes are probably impossible. They're too big, too varied. They sprawl across too large a swath of continent. Not that we shouldn't try. Trying to know the lakes has been the greatest professional challenge of my life and one of the biggest adventures. I'm not the first writer to try it, of course, nor am I the first to notice that learning a place is in many ways similar to learning and getting to know a human being. What makes humans unique is our personal and family histories, our appearance, size, gender, temperament, habits of speech, genetics, and the communities we live in. All the characteristics that make us who we are, a quality we sometimes call quiddity. Places have quiddity too. In the 1980s, my friend Craig Date and I spent two years paddling the lengths of 45 rivers in Michigan. We canoed, fished, explored the shorelines, camped, talked to local residents, and studied each river's history. We got to where we could read rivers as well as we could read books. In the end, we came away convinced that we could be blindfolded, spun in circles, and led to any section of those 45 rivers, and we would know immediately where we were. Even 30 years later, I think I would still know. All the qualities of a river combined make it unique. The color of the water, the speed of the current, the sand, silt, gravel, and rocks on the bottom, the shoreline vegetation, and the topography of the land around it. They all add up to the whole package. It's why no place is quite like any other place, and why there's no place in the world like the Great Lakes. Those of us who live here understand that, but most people around the world are clueless. They don't understand the most fundamental things about the lakes. They don't know that you can't see across them, or that for nearly four centuries the lakes have been critical to the economic and political fortunes of not just the United States and Canada, but of much of the world or that the five lakes collect the runoff of a drainage basin encompassing an area bigger than France, and that it is home to more than 37 million people, one in 10 Americans and a quarter of all Canadians, or that the lakes contain 95% of the surface freshwater on the surface in the United States, and nearly 20% of the world's. So much water that if you were to spill it evenly across the lower 48 states, it would form a lake 10 feet deep or that they are encircled by 10,000 miles of shoreline, more than the Atlantic and Pacific coasts of the United States combined, or that the lakes through much of the 20th century were the subject of bitter environmental battles that established much of the legislation that protects our water and air today, or that these lakes that were once declared dead are still alive and kicking and still need our protection. And of course, they don't know, even many of us who live here don't know, that these vast lakes that are so important globally must be protected locally. Often, often I'm asked what I think are the biggest issues facing the Great Lakes. Is it climate change, invasive species, phosphorus loading from agricultural runoff and municipal waste, petroleum and chemical spills, contaminated sediments, airborne deposition of heavy metals, the threat of diversion, sale, or theft of the water itself? Those are all big problems and they all need our attention. But I think there's an even bigger issue one that makes many of the problems threatening the lakes even more dangerous, one that might have made them possible in the first place. I fear the biggest threat to the Great Lakes, the biggest threat to the environmental health of the world, in fact, is anything that causes us to turn our backs, become cynical, or lose hope. Anything that makes us think it's too late to make a difference. Anything that makes us stay in our homes. Anything that makes us believe the insidious message beamed to us millions of times a day by every medium that our value is not as citizens, but as consumers. Anything that makes us believe the battles are already lost and that we might as well grab what we can for ourselves before somebody else gets it. In our complex world, our arguments for every point of view are broadcast strident stridently via media inconceivable only a generation ago. What are we to believe? In the midst of so much noise, how can we hear our own thoughts? I'm as baffled as anyone, but I know this much at least. If the noise gets too shrill, it helps to heed the words of E.B. White. When I get sick of what men do, he wrote, I have only to walk a few steps in another direction to see what spiders do, or what weather does. This sustains me very well indeed. Woods and rivers sustain us. So do cedar swamps, dunes, and beaches. But they can't sustain us when they're gone. And when they're bulldozed or poisoned or covered with asphalt, they're gone for good. Yet despite all the threats facing in the Great Lakes and their shorelines, there are reasons to be hopeful. When I meet people who are discouraged, I urge them to visit the North Shore of Superior, or the Keweenaw Peninsula, or Isle Royal, 
or any of the dunes and beaches along Lake Michigan, from Indiana dunes at the southern end to Sleeping Bear dunes in the north and the dunes along Highway 2 at the very top of the lake, or the Manitou Islands, or the North Channel of Georgian Bay, or Long Point on Lake Erie, or the mouth of the St. Lawrence at Kingston and downstream through the Thousand Islands. Those and hundreds of other places remind us that significant portions of the Great Lakes remain beautiful and healthy, and that it's all the more reason we should appreciate the lakes and remain vigilant in protecting them. I also tell them about the heartening work that universities, nonprofits, and government agencies are doing. From field research to adopt the beach programs, individuals and grassroots groups are making a difference. The Great Lakes Restoration Initiative has had and will continue to have an enormous impact. Those funds are financing projects that are improving water quality, cleaning up toxic pollution, reducing phosphorus runoff from farms and cities, restoring wetlands, and battling invasive species on a scale we haven't seen in decades. There's also important work being done to get kids involved. Place-based education programs in schools and in nonprofit organizations like the Kalamazoo Nature Center are getting kids outside and encouraging them to roll up their pant legs and get muddy. Up my way, the Boardman River Nature Center is doing great work. So is the Inland Seas Education Association in Sutton's Bay. Since 1989, the Inland Seas staff have taken more than 100,000 kids aboard their school ship into Branch Harbors Bay and given them hands-on experience with the freshwater ecology of Lake Michigan. And it's making a difference. Not long ago, I met a graduate student in, West, in Wisconsin who told me that spending one day on the Inland Sea schooner when she was in sixth grade inspired her to pursue a career in biology. Literally, she said, it changed my life. Getting kids outside is also what Kim Kaufman is doing at the Black Swamp Bird Observatory on the Ohio shore of Lake Erie. She told me that many of the kids that take school trips to the observatory have never been out of the city. When they step off the bus, they cluster around her in the parking lot and at first refuse to set foot in the woods and marshes. One girl asked in a frightened whisper if gorillas lived there. Another said in the haughty tone that only a 12-year-old girl can muster, I don't do nature. <laughs> Yet at the end of the day, those same children are often in tears because they don't want to leave. I'm hopeful also because everywhere I've gone in my travels, travels around the Great Lakes, I've listened to people talk about their concerns. Some of them are discouraged, and some have quit trying. Many are indifferent. Allow me to rephrase that. Most are indifferent, but most always have been. It's the ones who speak up who make a difference. And what I've heard from them, from young and old, educated and uneducated, from every race and religion and social class, is the same message. We care. We care about the water, the land, the air, and the living things we share them with. We care about the decisions made about our land and water and demand that those decisions not be made by people who profit when the land and water are plundered. We care enough to block locust industries that would harvest our natural resources and move on. We care when this place is abused because what happens to it happens to us, and we damned well take it personally. They might not use these words, but every one of those people is saying what I've been trying to say for 25 years. There's a soul to this place, and it touches my soul. sides to that. That's a couple different answers that I could give. One is that I've always wanted to write about the Great Lakes. I have notes that I wrote in college um, about doing it. I wrote to myself, write, about, uh, write a book about the Great Lakes, and then I wrote cryptically underneath it, the way the dune grass draws a circle in the sand. That image has stuck with me since childhood, and I had to make sure it found its way into the book. The other reason is because as I've traveled around working on other projects over the years, I always bring up the Great Lakes. I'm always curious to see what people in other countries and in California and New York and elsewhere think about the lakes. And of course what I learned is mostly they don't think about the Great Lakes. <laughs> and there, that became very um, beautifully illustrated a few years after I wrote The Living Great Lakes. If this had come up beforehand, it would have certainly found its way into that book. 
Um, instead, I put it into a, a later book. And, and I'll just read it. It's just a brief, a brief passage that says, that illustrates a lot more clearly than anything else I can say what we're up against in trying to tell the world about the lake. Is any place in North America as poorly understood as the Great Lakes? I'm no longer surprised to meet people who have no idea of the size of the lakes or of their significance to the history and geography of North America, or even much of an idea of their location. A magazine editor in New York called to discuss a story I was writing and asked, you're from Iowa or Ohio or one of those states, aren't you? He thought both were Great Lakes states. And about the five lakes themselves, he had no clue. He would have been shocked to learn that they are too large to see across, or that they and the St. Lawrence are bounded by eight states, two provinces, and nearly 200 tribal governments. A few years ago, the editors of a Utah-based magazine for elementary school students decided to profile the Great Lakes. Their research directed them to a website devoted to whale watching in Lake Michigan. <laughs> This activity was so compelling that they decided to make it the subject of a feature story titled, Thar She Blows. In <laughs> they wrote, every spring, the freshwater whales and freshwater dolphins begin their 1,300 mile migration from Hudson Bay to the warmer waters of Lake Michigan. <laughs> They went, then went on to explain that although there are several locks at Sault Ste. Marie, the whales and dolphins prefer to forge a faster route through the Canadian rivers until by mid-June they reach their breeding grounds in southern Lake Michigan. <laughs> there they feed on abundant populations of coho salmon, lake trout, and zebra mussels while sporting happily in the fresh water where, finally free of salt residue, they can swim 40% faster than the ocean. <laughs> Local residents welcome the returning migrants, they wrote, as they have since the Navajo first settled the shores of Lake Michigan. <laughs> a fourth grade teacher in Muskegon named Deb Harris had begun reading the story aloud to her students when she realized that something was fishy. <laughs> she hauled it in mid-sentence and exclaimed, oh my goodness, there are no whales in Michigan. Navajo? She called the editorial offices of Study, Studies Weekly, Inc., and informed them that they had made some mistakes. A staff member replied sniffily that the magazine stood behind the story. Deb Harris was quite certain the story was wrong. The staff member insisted it was right. Deb Harris said, I've lived here all my life. There are no whales in Lake Michigan. <laughs> Later, the magazine printed a retraction, revealing that the website from which they had gathered their information was a hoax. We at Studies Weekly want this to be a lesson to you as well, the retraction read. Not all websites are true, and you cannot always believe it. <laughs> website is down now, but someday I hope that somebody will stand up in the audience and say, I did that. <laughs> I like to that it's very convincing and great photography too. <laughs> well, we can go either way. I can read some more or we can, we can talk. Uh, there, is there anything, <coughs> anyone burning with a comment or a question? Yes, sir. Is there danger that uh, demand will place on the water in the Great Lakes by other states when drought is coming? Are we protected? We are protected. The Great Lakes Compact is pretty good legislation, I'm told, by people who are experts on legislation. Um, a, an environmental lawyer named Jim Olson who lives up in Traverse City and who's a friend of mine, um, has been fighting with this and against this issue for many years. And he knows the, the law very well, and he knows the loopholes in the law as well. He says the Great Lakes Compact is a good starting point. And what the compact is, is it's the agreement that the eight governors, the Great Lakes states governors, and the, um, and the leaders of the provinces of Ontario and Quebec agreed to, to basically say nobody does anything to the lakes without everybody's approval. So we're all in this together. And then before that, it was chaos, as you probably remember. There was a lot of trouble. Now, when a community like a, a suburb of Chicago wants to draw water out of Lake Michigan because their 
groundwater has subsided so far that it's reached a zone of, of poison. Um, they can't do it unless everybody agrees that they can. And so far, none of them have been allowed to do that. Um, it's, a, it's going to, you're right, there will be drought and there will be times when, when this becomes a central, central issue. I've, I've gotten into really interesting conversations with college students about the moral questions. What do we do when people are dying of thirst? And that's, that's really interesting to hear um, smart university students debate this because on purely legal terms, we can't let them have it. But morally and ethically, I think most of us would agree that, yeah, we have to let them have it. But Jim Olson's biggest fear, the biggest loophole in the compact is with groundwater. And he, he has argued persuasively and effectively, and he's been proven right by the, by the Michigan Supreme Court, that groundwater is part of the watershed of the Great Lakes. And yet, still, companies are pumping the water out to bottle it for, as drinking water and shipping it outside of the region. And you know, it's a drop in bucket. It's not enough water to affect the levels of the lakes, although it is taking some of the aquifers down and, and causing some, some fine trout streams to, to be in trouble. Um, but he's worried about the precedent. So the short answer is we've got a protection but it isn't maybe as firm as we hope it would be. Sir. I worked on plain old paper back in the 60s and so forth, and they contributed a lot of contaminants into the county of the river, which goes to the Great Lakes. That has been corrected, I think, but are there still there are. Um, industry has really. The question, the question. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the gentleman worked at, is it Plain Well Paper Company? Plain Well Paper in the 1960s, which was a um, polluter of the Kalamazoo River, and um, the, the pollutants ran into Lake Michigan, of course. And are there still industrial pollutants, um, polluters? The industry has stepped up. They they are they are invested now, and we are not. I don't think we're going to see that kind of pollution again from industries. There's occasional mistakes, of course. There are still a lot of petroleum and chemical spills, thousands of them a year. Um, most of them a few a few gallons. Some of them really bad, as you guys know really well. Your own Kalamazoo River. Um, that that was the biggest interior spill, petroleum spill in the United States history. And it's still being cleaned up, it's still still costing your community. Um, the bigger threat though, I think, from spills is coming from municipal water systems, treatment systems, and from agriculture. Um, about, I think 2005, was the first time that I attended a conference where um, biologists, in the Great Lakes were talking to farmers about what was going on with the runoff from their fields. And that was uh, about 10 years after a lot of, of farmers, a lot of corn, especially corn and other um, fast growing crops, were converting over from organic um, um, fertilizers to liquid fertilizers, and specifically manure. And what they were doing is they found it was a lot cheaper and faster to just mix the the manure in with, with water, make a slurry, and spray it on the fields. They could do it in a lot less time. Now, your, the organic gardeners here will know that an organic um, decomposing or decomposed manure worked into the ground, not only provides quick nitrogen and phosphorus for fertilizer, but also enriches the soil. But farmers that are you know, struggling to make a living or, or are on a factory sort of farm basis are more interested in quick results. And so that manure was really a, a godsend for them. Suddenly their crops would just fly up. The problem was that if there was a rain event at, within a, you know, a week or so of them spraying that on, most of it, like 90, 95% of it would run off into the ditches and the creeks, find its way into Lake Michigan or into the Great Lakes. So in 2005, when I attended this conference in Ohio, um, there were biologists saying, 
within a few years, we're going to see algae blooms in Lake Erie like there were in the 60s. And um, we're going to see dead areas in the lake as well, which they haven't seen in, in 20 years. And they were right. That's happening right now. Those, um, the, the, dead, the dead area is growing. Nothing lives there. There's no, not enough oxygen for anything except bacteria and a few organisms that are very, very hardy. And um, the algae, if any of you have been to Lake Erie in the last few years, you've seen it. The algae is piled up on the shore again, and it's a rotting mess, and it's keeping people away. Well, sorry, but in Lake Erie, like last year, I mean, 2014, Toledo did not have drinking water for 550,000 people because the algal bloom bloomed right over the intake of the drinking water for Toledo. So, and they couldn't wash in it. They couldn't boil it down because the contaminants would cause like diarrhea and dizzy spells and a lot of other issues. So the algal blooms are not, they're a big, a big substantial deal. These are not right. 550,000 people without water. Yeah. yeah. And so, and so that's what we're facing. And the you know, predictions are the same things. Oh no, you're right. You're absolutely right. And that's, that is, is a big deal. It's a huge deal. It's as big a deal as the industrial pollutants were in the 60s, and it has to be addressed. Problem is there's really not much legislation. It, it, right now, it's my understanding, and, and maybe you know uh, something going on that I don't, but my understanding is that it's all voluntary now. Farmers are being urged to plant trees along their, their waterways, create that, that riparian zone that protects the water. You know, the trees will filter, the roots of the trees will filter out a lot of the, the Fertilizers. So, so that's cool. Well, and you've got the governor of Ohio who doesn't want to legislate <coughs> control over the agricultural runoff. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. We've met, um, my wife and I met some farmers in Wisconsin who are um, dairy farmers. And, you know, dairy farms create a lot of, a lot of <laughs> phosphorus. And, and they, they have really taken this seriously. And they are, uh, going voluntarily at it. And the community, it's near Manitowoc, and the whole community is kind of rallying around them and is rewarding them for their efforts by buying their their dairy products. But, but I think it's a bigger problem than can be done by a few farmers. Is there something in the yeah. here? Can you talk a little bit about um, when you went to the Edmund Fitzgerald reunion and the guy told the story um, about his rescue of people simultaneously to when the Edmund Fitzgerald went down? Yes, the, the story of the Edmund Fitzgerald is the one story everyone around the, the world knows, thanks to Gordon Lightfoot's ballad. And, um, and that was really the one I didn't think I was going to have to tell much. You know, I, could, I thought I could, I could tell that story in a page or two. It's, it's a heartbreaking story, of course. But um, just by pure chance, on the day that was the anniversary of the sinking of the Fitzgerald, which is November 10th, thank you, November 10th, um, and it sank in 1975, it was, I think it was November 10th, 1990, something late 90s, that I woke, and while I was working on this book, I woke one morning, I, I live, Gail and I live up by Traverse City on Old Mission Peninsula in an old farmhouse, and we woke up that morning, the anniversary of the sinking of the Fitzgerald, with our house rocking in the wind. It was the strongest wind we had ever experienced on, on Old Mission. And I, I got up and checked the weather and saw that the wind was blowing at 80 miles an hour in the Straits of Mackinac. And I just said, I, I have to get up there. I have to get up to Lake, to Whitefish Point and see Lake Superior in a storm that rivals the one that sank the Fitzgerald on the anniversary. You know, it was just too, too amazing a, and a coincidence not to not to get up there. So I drove up and I um, was driving, you know, I mean, the power was out all across the UP. I had to drive around fallen trees into the ditch to get places. The bridge was just reopened as I got there, but going across them, they, you know, speed limit was like 20 and, you know, wind is blowing car <laughs> like this. And it, was, it was an intense storm, intense. And, when I got up there, I, I met a guy who was filming the waves, and he was out on a break wall on the, on the fishing dock on the east side of Whitefish Point, some of you might be familiar with, just before you get to the, the museum and the bird observatory. Um, it's just I'm on those little side roads to the east, and 
He's out on the break walk and waves, I mean, they weren't as high as the ceiling, but they were, <coughs> they were smashing that break wall and the spray was going as high as, as it, definitely as high as Kirk, probably even higher. And they were washing right over him. And every time they would wash, he would co cover his head and <laughs> wash right over him. I was gonna wash the guy get the washroom like in the drama. When he came to shore, I ran up and said, what are you doing? You know, and he said, well, I'm filming waves for the, what, for the, the museum, for a documentary we're doing. And he said, are you here for the reunion? And I, I said, no, what, what reunion? And he said, well, every year on the anniversary of the sinking of Fitzgerald, the children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews of the men whose lives were lost to come for a reunion and, and talk about it. And, and he said, you should come. Well, I'd like to. So he invited me in, and I, I got to meet, meet some people, and I sat in the back because I felt you know, I didn't really have a right to be there. I just wanted to sit in the back and watch. Um, it's kind of a long story. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get to it, but the, they had a guest in, a man named John Lufkins, who was the chairman of the Brimley um, tribe, Native American tribe. At, at, at that time, he was no longer the chairman. He was, I believe he was 50. And he um, said, I have a story to tell that I've told very few people. And it turned out that he and his nephew had gone out on Whitefish Bay. And you know, Whitefish Bay is huge. It's the whole eastern end of Lake Superior. And he had gone out there that morning um, to check their gill nets. And this was the morning before this, the sinking of the fish show. And, um, and when they were out there, they got caught in the storm. And they, they couldn't make, they were in a small boat, 16 foot open boat with an outboard and they couldn't make it short and they knew it they, this storm came on them so suddenly that it just was a white squall and obliterated all all sight they couldn't see shore they couldn't see a thing the waves went from two feet high to five feet high within minutes and they they landed on Jaquamanam Island and which is a very small island nobody lives there but they found a trapper's or a duck hunter's cabin tar paper shack really, just a tar paper roof and sides and a door. And it had a little oil furnace in it with a couple inches of oil in this rusty old reservoir. And they got it lit, so they knew they were okay. But then, um, just as it was getting dark, he went out to check to make sure the boat was pulled up far enough on shore. And as he came back, the boat, the wind yanked the, the door up out of his hand as he was closing it. And he, when he turned to look at it, out of the corner of his eye, he caught a glimpse of orange out on the water. And so he looked in and he saw it again and realized it was a life jacket and that somebody was out there. And so he told his nephew, I'm going out, see if I can help him. And he took this <laughs> boat out and he said, as soon as he got out in the open water again, off out of the lee of the island, the wind was so strong that every time he'd get to the top of a wave, it would spin the boat around because there was no weight in the bow. So he had no control. He would get down, the only control he would have is when he was in the troughs of the waves. By now these waves are eight feet high. And he'd be down in the troughs, and he'd zip along, and he's trying to zigzag in the direction that he saw this orange, but pretty soon he didn't know which direction he was going, let alone where it was, and he began to realize that he was in serious trouble. And at one point, he said he kind of went around with one wave into the trough of another, and there, right in front of him, is a capsized boat with two men in orange life jackets clinging to the hull. And so he just, on the spur of the moment, just broke, rammed his boat right on top of that, that hull between the two men, ran to the bow, grabbed the nearest one, and pulled him by the collar into the boat. And then a wave smashed him and drove the two boats apart. And at that moment, he realized that this was his cousin, who was also a commercial fisherman who had been out that day checking nets. And so he started zigzagging again, trying to find the boat again, and purely by chance found it again, did the same thing, drove up on the hull, reached down, grabbed the other man, who was also his cousin, pulled him into the boat, and got him to shore, and they saved him, so they survived. They were able to get him into, they had a couple dry sleeping bags and plastic bags, and got him into sleeping bags. And, but he said in the morning, they had a transistor radio, and um, but his batteries were weak, so they didn't want to listen to it until um, morning and, and you know try to get a little bit of an idea of how long the storm was going to last. Of course they knew their families were going to be terrified, worried about it. And he turned it on in the morning. The very first thing they said was that the Fitzgerald had been lost off Whitefish Point and it was feared that it was gone. There was no sign of survivors. And they could see practically where it was from that spot. So of course this room of people who, you know, for whom 
some years later, this was still really raw. You couldn't, you could literally have heard a pin drop. It was, it was an amazing, an amazing moment. Hello? Five memorable streams? Oh, man. There's a lot more than five. That's a, that's just, you know, Canoeing Michigan River is, was my first book, and it was I co-wrote it with with the, my friend for my my best friend of all of my life, Craig Day, who died a month ago, and and it's really hard to even begin to talk about how much of he affected my life and how what a, what an amazing experience it was with that doing that book, two years of paddling together every weekend practically and really almost every weekend. We would run and we'd do a sort section of a river and then have to come back because we had to work during the week. And then when we got some time off, I mean, getting laid off, I was a carpenter and Craig was a jack of all trades. Getting laid off was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and we could head for the UP and we could do the long trips, you know. The longest we did was two solid weeks of paddling together. And we did 1,500 miles of rivers together. And together, every weekend and many longer stretches for those two years, and we got sick of each other exactly once, just once. And I've written about that in, in, a, in one book, but it had just gotten to be too much. It was at the end of that two weeks in, in the UP, it was September, it was cold, it was raining, and we had just had it, we were exhausted. And I, I was usually the stern man, because I was big. And I was just sick of looking at his back. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the only time. That was the only time. What a, an amazing guy. And we, so it was all, a, it, there was so much discovery there. Because we knew rivers. We had paddled and fished all across Michigan. And um, we knew probably 12 rivers really well. Then we knew a couple a little bit. The rest of them were a surprise. They were all a delight. And we would get to, to you know, places we didn't expect to find beautiful rivers when we'd find them. We've, we find them down here. The Upper Kalamazoo is fantastic, and we, we fell in love with it. Long stretches of the Grand, even though the Grand didn't make it into the book in the end, because so much of it is better suited for power boats than for paddle craft. We decided not to put it in, even though we had paddled a lot of it. And I've regretted it ever since. And in fact, I've gotten some irate letters. <laughs> <laughs> the Delagiac, the St. Joe, um, the Huron and Ann Arbor, that was a big surprise to us. Some of the UP rivers that we didn't know about. There were rivers that we literally did not know existed, like the, the um, West Branch of the Muskegon. Never even heard of it. It turned out to be one of the, one of the really fun, fast, challenging rivers in the North Peninsula. So. It, there's a lot more than five. That, that one, yeah. And Craig, I wish he was here to tell you. He was here. Here's a question over here, Jerry. Okay, we're, we're working against nature. Like, if you look in California, they're digging deep into the ground to get all that water out. And instead of working with the plants that you have that will grow in your state and try to grow more of that and then disperse it out and trade. Um, because we're working against nature, and that's part of our problem. Yes. And, um, are you seeing that maybe farmers will start moving towards what they can grow in their area versus trying to work against nature? Well, I hope so. <laughs> you know, there's definitely trends in that direction. You know, one of the reasons that um, industry is is working harder and in communities, bit large cities especially, have you know really got on board because they see that a clean environment is economically smart. It's good economically. Farmers, maybe, you know, we're, with all the, the local food, interest in local foods, the interest in organics, um, maybe. But I, I, you know, I don't know. Because you get out, have, have you been to the Great Plains recently and seen the factory farms? And in the Southwest, you know, the big circle of irrigation, you can, if you fly over them, you can see them. I mean, you can see these things from space. There's a lot of water being wasted, just a lot of water. And it's just hard to get it's hard to get the large farms to change. I think I don't I don't know a lot about about the, the agricultural world, but where I know it is where water comes in into play. With it. And um, 
Yeah, the, the groundwater depletion, the, what's happened to the rivers, rivers in, in the West, and, and in our part of the country, the rivers you know, are, are suffering because of the runoff, and it's a tough, it's a tough issue. Because we're, I mean, we're, we like our food a lot. We really like food, and we like it to be inexpensive. And the only way to have inexpensive food is for it to be grown on a large scale. So, you know. Yes? Would you talk about water and fracking in Michigan? Yeah. That, it's emotional. It's emotional because there's so much at stake. Oh, we'll talk about fracking and water in Michigan. You know, I, I, I have a friend, an acquaintance, who is an um, environmental writer. He was the, one of the chief environmental writers for the New York Times for a long time, and now he's a freelancer. And he, he completely changed direction in his thinking and has come to believe that fracking can be a good thing and that it's not necessarily an, a, an evil. And his arguments are, you know, I mean, he's, he has good arguments. The, the industry, of course, they have a, they're, they're under a lot of pressure to do it right, to, to be safe. Um, but the, the part that bothers me, and I think a lot of people, is that if something goes wrong, the consequences are so severe that it isn't worth it. Is it, is it really worth it? And, um, you know, the issue, I mean, extends beyond fracking, of course. It also issues to the issue to the piping, pipeline controversies. And again, you guys have been through it, and people around the country are now looking at Kalamazoo and, and the Kalamazoo River and Enbridge as, as a cautionary tale of what can happen. If that happens, if fracking, I mean, it, are, the, are the slight earthquake tremors that people are feeling in, in, in Pennsylvania and upstate New York and in the Dakotas and places where there's a lot of fracking going on, is it related? It sure seems, logically, it sure seems like it must be because it, those, the number and severity of them is definitely on the increase since fracking began. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I worry about it. It's one of those things that I worry about, definitely. Speak. Yeah, just speak. Uh, I'm sorry. I heard on public radio this morning of a crude oil pipeline running from north and south and across the Mackinac Straits. And it was mentioned that if that would rupture, it just r runs on the bottom of, this, of, 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 of the lake, that if that would rupture, that it would be devastating. And apparently it's 60 years old. Do you know anything about that? I do. Um, that's the Enbridge line. Okay. And it comes <laughs> in carrying, um, it's carrying heavy crude from the sand Santar fields in Alberta, um, across the Straits and across Michigan to Port Huron and across the, the St. Clair River to um, Canada, to refineries in Canada. And I, I don't know how much Michigan is earning for the right to allow that, but it isn't, I guarantee you, it isn't enough. Because if you're right, if that were to rupture, that it would be a catastrophe like, unlike anything we've seen ever in, in the United States, if, or at least in the interior of the United States. The, the, the stuff is terrible. And those pipelines were not, there's a pair of them, and they're about 30 inches in diameter. And they were not designed to carry this heavy crude with sand in it. They, um, I heard one expert say it's like sandpaper. This is sandpaper wearing out the pipe the pipes. Um, we even had a letter to the editor in Traverse City, to the Traverse City Record Eagle, from a man um, I'd like to talk to who was a uh, on the crew that was laying that pipe in 1956 or so, seven, in the late 50s when it was laid down. And he's worried. He said, he was a welder. He welded the joints that connected the pipes. And so the welds are good. <laughs> and like that, not applied. But he was worried about the pipes because they are um, suspended above the bottom. They're not just lying on the bottom. They're suspended on, on, on harnesses. And I've seen underwater photography of them holding them up. And some of those harnesses are broken, which means that there's stretches of pipeline that are sagging. They're hanging between them. And, I mean, 
anybody who's driven over the, the Straits Macro has also seen the vessels going through. There's a lot of boat traffic. All it would take is one ore carrier or other freighter to drop an anchor accidentally or to have an anchor drag during a storm. This, this pipeline is a few miles west of the, of the um, bridge. Terrible. It'd be a terrible catastrophe. So, you know, I, I urge you, there's a, um, an organization, oilandwaterdon'tmix.org, and they have a website, and you can sign a petition online really easily to, to Governor Snyder to urge him to put pressure on Enbridge to upgrade these pipelines. We have a contract with them. They're not going to take them out. They're not going to stop piping, sending the oil, but we can get them to upgrade the pipes. Yes, sir. What, what are your next projects, plural? Well, um, the, the question about the California water touches right on it. I'm working on a proposal right now to do a book about the state of water in America. And it would be a travelogue, a, a, a road trip for many months all around the country and into Canada and Mexico, looking at water resources and what's being done. And I, that's when I will get into fracking in, in a lot more in depth way. That's a good point. The, the light bulb issue is definitely one we have to work on. I, I'm going to leave that one up to other people, but I, I might touch on it because you're right, it is an important one. What's going on with water in, in America and um, what can be done and, what's, and what, are the, you know, what are some strategies we can use? And it's not going to be all gloom and doom because I'm, part of the reason I'm doing this is because I'm enchanted with water, with rivers and lakes, and I want to be on them as much as possible, and what better excuse? <laughs> Pardon me? Yeah, I'll look into more into that. I'm not very familiar with it. I just have seen the headlines. I see there's a guy way in the back who's been raising sand. Yes, sir? Um, the Asian carp. What's yeah. being done to keep it out of the lakes? Yeah, now there's one of the issues that was the Asian carp. What's being done to keep them out of the Great Lakes? This was an issue that was not touched on. I'll get you next. <laughs> after, um, I keep forgetting. Um, after I did this book is really when this issue came up. The electric barriers, of course, probably most people know by now is, is really kind of a joke. I mean, the, there was nothing really done. They were, they were put in place and then they weren't put into app, application for a while. And, and then a lot of people say they're not going to work anyway. I had one, one biologist for the DNR in Ohio tell me off the record that the only reason that Asian carp aren't in the Great Lakes right now is because the Illinois River is so polluted they can't get through the, the <laughs> San Francisco ship there. There's not enough oxygen for them, so that's what's keeping them back. So I don't think we should keep polluting the river. So I don't know. I think that's it's definitely going to be an issue. There, there is going to be. Everyone I've talked to says they're going to be here. There's not much we can do. The question is how much damage will they do? It won't be that one thing I was kind of glad to hear, I mean, as much as you can be glad of anything about that issue, is that they probably won't have any impact on the, on the big bodies of water because they're algae feeders and they don't, they would have to, one guy, one biologist calculated that a single um, Asian carp would need um, 1,300 square, no, 1,300 cubic miles of the open part of Lake Michigan to live on. To, he would have to cruise that much water in a single day to find enough algae to live on. So they're going into the river mouths, into the harbors, into the marinas, up the rivers, and they're gonna create havoc. And I don't think there's a whole lot that can be done about it. Wait, I promise this guy. Would you care to comment on the removal of dams on our inland streams? Ah, the dam removals. Um, well, you know, the Boardman River was, was the first was the poster child for this project, my river, and we very unfortunately had the dam wash out while it was being dismantled. And a lot of people who were in favor of the dam removal are now very bitter about it because <laughs> their, their houses were flooded. Um, it has to be done, I think. It has to be done slowly and carefully. Um, but, but one of the things that concerns me is I'd like, as a trout fisherman, I would like to see it done with moderation. For instance, on the Boardman, we have a small 
dam right in the city of Traverse City at Union Street that is really effective at keeping salmon from going up into the river. And once those upper dams are all gone, there's two more to go after, after Brown Bridge. Once those are done, gone, without some way of stopping salmon, the salmon will get all the way up into the upper reaches and we know from lots of the cases that that's really hard on native trout populations. And the Boardman is one of those rivers that has pretty wild trout. They haven't been planted in, in 50, no more than 60, no 55 years now, since the early 60s. And so genetically they're, they're in good shape and we want to keep it that way. But, um, but I, yeah, I want rivers to run free. We're not using that, that hydropower anymore anyway, so let's let them run. Yes, sir, and or ma'am, the, the little girl. <laughs> Uh, my most favorite trip to one of the Great Lakes, while working on the book. Well, I think it's one that, that doesn't get talked much about. It's in the book, but it was a canoeing on the north shore of Lake Superior at the Puckasaw National um, Park, which is one of the most remote parts of all the Great Lakes. And I, I went in a, a canoe that was a replica of the Voyager canoes that the French fur traders used to explore the Great Lakes and to carry furs back in the 1600s, the 1700s, and early 1800s. And we, we took this canoe along the shore of Lake Superior the way the Voyagers did. We, we paddled it in for many miles. We camped on the shore. We ate the foods that the Voyagers ate. Um, pemmican and, and other things that don't taste very good when they're cooked over a stove, but when you've been paddling all day, they're delicious. <laughs> that was really one of the most fun. It's <coughs> there in the red. Have you ever hiked on an Isle Royale? I have. Um, Isle Royale was a, was a lot of fun, too. My wife and I did a trip there. And we, we paddled um, around the Finger Lakes part portion at the north end of the island and hiked day trips from there. We would camp, set up camp in our canoe and then do some day trip hiking, but we didn't do extensive trail hiking yet. We'd like to yet, but one of the great, great places in America and the least visited national park in America. It used to be in America. A couple more questions. Here's one here. Uh, yes. I had a question about your book publishing venture and uh, what you hope to accomplish that and what you think that will sort of help remedy with, you know, as opposed to the book industry in general? Well, the, the book, the project that you're talking about is, is Big Maple Press, and this is named for the, the enormous sugar maple in our front yard. And like a lot of things that I um, set out to do, it's motivated by fun. <laughs> we really love books in every way. And so Glenn Wolf, the artist who's done so many of my books and who I've been great friends with now for 20 some years, and my wife Gail and I, had been brainstorming for a long time about publishing books together because we, you know, we work with big New York publishers who are so number driven. You know, they need a book. They don't, they're only interested in a book if they can sell so many copies. It was a tough sell to get them to do a book on the Great Lakes. I I had a really hard time convincing um, a major publisher that there was a big enough audience. Um, so we have a lot of ideas for books that are more modest than even that, that are about you know celebrating Michigan or um, or even more specific subjects like you know a, 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 an essay in celebration of rivers, um, a long essay in celebration. So we thought, why not do our own books the way we want to make them, make them beautiful, make them um, really fun projects, and publish them ourselves. Well, the problem with publishing them ourselves, and we knew this from talking to lots and lots of small publishers, is that it's a full-time job. And we don't want to work at it full-time. We want to write and illustrate and, um, and you know, keep creating them. So how can we make this manageable and still fun? Well, one way would be to just sell them to independent bookstores. Because we, over the years, we've established good relationships with lots of them, and they've supported us. And, and there's some loyalty involved because when we, when Glenn Wolf and I first started out, the two books that are the first two that we've done with Big Maple Press that are out in the lobby now, It's Raining Frogs and Fishes about wonders of the sky and The Bird and Waterfall about wonders of water, um, were published by a, a big 
big publisher in New York, but and they did fine. In fact, Strange Parts of Fishes um, hit the lower end of the bestseller list scale. But we um, would not have survived as artists if it wasn't for independent bookstores. In those days, this was in the 90s, um, before Amazon was really a force, the big forces in publishing were Barnes & Noble and Borders. And they weren't very interested in us. They, they were interested in the tried and true New York Times bestsellers. And we, we just didn't make much progress with them. But independent booksellers loved these books, and they were telling people about them and selling them and hand selling them, and elevated these to bestseller them. And in fact, our editor at HarperCollins, who's you know been in this industry for his entire life, he's in, at that time he was well into his 60s, said he had never seen a grassroots pro, um, at a promotional effort that succeeded as well as ours. He couldn't believe it. And all we did was talk to independent booksellers, and they loved the book, and they sold. So we wanted to give back to them, make books that please us, that are fun, and 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 a pleasure to hold in their hands, and that our, our friends can sell. And then that way we don't have to have a warehouse of thousands of books. <laughs> yes, sir. When, when you uh, go paddling on a river, how long does it take you to uh, put your day-to-day -day life behind and connect to the river? And, and when you're all done paddling, how long does it take you to start longing to get back on the river again? It's called the re-entry problem. <laughs> and it works both ways, you're absolutely right. We, we talk about this a lot. It really, of course, it depends on the place. It depends where you are. But when you've been really working hard and you're way crazy and you don't know where you are and what you're doing and you're lost in thought all the time and you need to get in touch with something solid. You get on the water. It might take three days. It might take three solid days. And I mean, that's kind of the rule of thumb for vacations, right? I've found paddling and, and fishing are... Um, a really good way to accelerate that. So usually it's more like half a day. Sometimes it's 10 minutes. Sometimes it's when you push off from the bank and you feel that current the first time, that first stroke. That's, that's when it's fun. And then the, the reentry problem works the other way when you get back and then you have to face work again. And then it's, it's hard. So always, I always figure on one day of just drumming my fingers on my desk and playing solitaire. <laughs> I do want to add one more thing to the question about publishing. I didn't address Amazon, uh, the new giant on the, on the block. Um, I, I didn't have a problem, and I don't really even have a problem now with Amazon.com. Um, it's, it's a good deal, they're, and their service is great, and they are really good at what they do. And it's very easy to push a couple buttons and, and order, order anything you want. I mean, Backwards books, of course. They started with books because it was a really easy way to get into retailing, is the way I've heard it described. But um, their, their sales and their, definitely their profit are a lot bigger on a, with other items. They are making a profit on books. Where I got into, where I lost um, respect for Jeff Bezos and his crew is that um, in, 19, no, in 2009, my publisher, um, he approached my publisher which was actually a whole big group of publishers, Macmillan, included St. Mark's Press. And he said, um, we're, we're not, we don't want to pay you that much anymore. We're, we want to give you a smaller percentage of your ebook sales. And Macmillan just, you know, naturally enough said, well, wait a minute, we had an agreement. And they said, no, we're not going to do it anymore. We want to pay you less. And McMillan said, well, we're not going to let you. We'll sue you if you insist. And so McMillan pulled all McMillan titles off Amazon. All my books, you could not have bought my books from, from Amazon for, for four months. None of, none of the, our books were available. They, the, the cover was there, but there was no buy button. You could buy it. And in fact, they would even put up recommendations for other books that you should be buying. So, we're going, wait a minute, you know, this, this is really bullying. This is bullying behavior. Well, they did it again last year. Yep. This time they did it with, um, I've forgotten which group, another group of publishers. Hatchet. Hatch, Hatchet is a problem? Hatchet, yes. Hatchet. Yeah. Same thing happened. Well, this time a bunch of big name authors said, wait a minute, because they were Hatchet authors. 
They said, we're not going to stand for this. So I joined up with them. There were 600 authors, and we signed a petition that was published as a full-page ad in the New York Times protesting the bullying tactics. So that's also why. Um, if I'm disappeared, or if, <laughs> or if you, you hear that my books are no longer available anywhere in the universe, that you'll know what happened. And that would be kind of a fun David and Goliath story, too. We're a little impressed with three people and a few books up against them. Oh, there's one up there. Up to the left. Okay. Yes? Have you done much sailing since your journey? Have I done much sailing to, since the journey? No. I, I, and it's not because I don't want to, I just haven't had many opportunities. Although the crew that I'm, um, there's, there were two kinds of sailing in the book. The Malabar on the schooner Malabar. Um, was an amazing experience. That was way outside my comfort zone. I had never sailed a, a schooner at all. Now, I'd been on smaller sailboats growing up and stuff, but I never really, um, you know, it didn't take with me. But the other big experience in the book is sailing from the, sh on the in the Chicago to, to Mackinac race on a, on a much smaller boat and a much faster boat. And that was really interesting and fun. And that crew, which are, those guys are from the Grand Rapids and Muskegon areas, they invited me back a couple times that I haven't been able to make it, so so I haven't been able to do it. So I don't know if I'm still susceptible to seasickness. <laughs> I think I beat it. I think I beat it. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. For my next book, will I be paddling all the way to the mouth of the Colorado River? I would have if there wasn't just sand. It's the, unfortunately most of the year, most years, the mouth of the Colorado is dried up. All that water has been sucked away by Las Vegas and Los Angeles and industries and farms. And, that, and that's one of the stories I wanted to tell. There's a there's a whole. I mean, there's ecosystems that are dried up. There's a, there's an indigenous culture on the, at the in the the Delta area of the Colorado that has lived for thousands of years on fishing and they're they're displaced now. Yeah, it's a mess. Well, and the, the nuclear uh, things that we had in Michigan, they're like their hands are full of nuclear waste, and I don't think the government can afford all these nuclear power plants on the on our side of the country to ship it all over to Nevada and they're building all these nuclear power plants in Florida, and it's just piling up. I, I, I can go for a long time. <laughs> Way back in the back, young man. Yes. Do I consider them to be the most? Oh, of course, the most valuable natural resource in the world. We can't live without water. It's the greatest reservoir of fresh liquid, fresh water on the planet. Um, absolutely, I, I, I would. I would testify in Congress to that, to that point, yes. So, there's, wow, Karen, help, you choose. Oh, here, we've got one right here, Karen. I'm just wondering about the title, because I didn't know if they could refer to Leech and the Great Lakes that is 25% of what it was years ago. Diaperia. I don't know if I'm identifying as the proper organism. The, the, well, you, she referred specifically to Dipariah that I mentioned in my prepared remarks. The, the organism that has lived, has always lived in the bottom, in the silt, the bottom of the Great Lakes, in concentrations up to 10,000 per, per square meter. It is now disappearing. Um, and other, other organisms that are disappearing or, or have disappeared, that, and what can be done to, to protect them and, and perhaps bring them back. A lot of people are working in that. The Dipariah is an interesting one because everyone assumed until recently that it was disappearing because of zebra and quagga mussels, because the mussels are filtering the plankton out that Dipariah feeds on. 
And this is a, it's a, it's a, well, it's not a crustacean, but it's a, a it looks like a, um, a little shrimp. And it will, it wiggles out of the silt, and it's got feelers, and it grabs plankton and phytoplankton as they go by and feeds on it. And they also rise and lower in the food column. At, at night, they'll go up and come down. They're really important food for many fish, including whitefish. In fact, they were one of the main dietary standards for whitefish. And um, now that they're disappearing in Lakes Michigan and here, the, the whitefish are suffering. They're really going down. And they're, you know, commercial fishermen are talking about catching 24-inch um, whitefish that are only as big around as their wrist. They're so skinny. And they're starting to feed on on um, quagga mussels, which they can't digest, and yeah, it's, it's a big problem. What they recently found, though, was that it wasn't the, the, the maybe not the mussels that are causing the dipariah to die, but a bacteria. And that's kind of weird, because it has never happened before. And there's a similar die-off that has occasionally taken place in um, the Baltics. So it's possible that there's a bacterial invader that's that's killing this organism, and that you know that can be a little frightening. So a lot of people researching, a lot of people trying to figure it out. The, the Toledo Water Studies Institute. There, I sat with a bunch of uh, graduate students, who each of them there were twenty some of them. They each had chosen an organism from um, Eastern Europe, from the Baltic states, and east uh, and throughout Eastern Europe, that where a lot of our invaders have come from. And they each chose one that has not yet arrived in the Great Lakes, and they're studying it and writing papers about it, so we'll be prepared if they show up. Okay, I'm going to call it and have one more question, and then if you would give Jerry time to come this way to get up to the table where he will be signing books, I would appreciate it if you would give us just a second. I just, I just have a yes, no answer to the question. I'm over here, the other way. <laughs> Are you speaking at the Quiet Water Symposium this year in Lansing? No. No, when is it? Oh, Mark, I know it's this Saturday. Saturday. No. Sat not this Saturday or next Saturday. Right? This Saturday. I'm not Saturday. sure. No, I haven't been to the, I haven't been there in years. I um I don't know why either. I just, they haven't invited me in. I, <laughs> but I'm not hurt. Thank you all. Thank you.